everyone and welcome in to Chairside Live. I'm your host, Megan Strong. In this episode, we have part one of an exciting interview with public speaker, author, and dental practice consultant, Dr. David Schwab. Then, it's time for another edition of Across the Chair, where our own Will Schmidt is discussing his tips for selecting the right impression tray for each patient. But first, Dr. Neil Park, Director of Clinical Affairs here at Glidewell Laboratories, recently interviewed Dr. David Schwab. They were at the Academy of Osseo Integration 2016 annual meeting. So today we're taking a look at part one of this three-part interview series. Check it out. I'm Dr. Neil Park, Director of Clinical Affairs for Glidewell Laboratories, and we're here in San Diego at the annual meeting of the Academy of Osseo Integration. My guest is David Schwab, PhD. David Schwab is a motivational speaker, a consultant, and an author who helps dentists grow their practices, educate their patients, and train their teams so that the practices will reach their full potential. His website is davidschwab.com. Welcome, David. Thank you, Neil. Pleasure to be here. Let's get right to it. So the big question, how does a guy with a PhD in English get into the field of dental practice management? Neil, it was my good fortune. I was actually finishing my PhD in Chicago at Northwestern when I heard about this job at the ADA. So I went over to the ADA and they were looking for a skill set. They wanted somebody who could analyze, somebody who could write, somebody who could do presentations and that sort of thing. And it sort of meshed. So I did finish my PhD and I went to work for the ADA and I did things like accreditation. I was administratively in charge of the accreditation of all the specialty programs in the United States as well as GPR programs, AGD, and so forth. Then I did marketing for them. When I left, I was actually director of marketing. And it was a really great experience. It was my residency to go all over the place and learn a lot about dentistry. After that, I was executive director of the American College of Prosthodontists. And I started and continue to this day a very full speaking schedule. I do consulting for dental practices and try to help the practices grow and reach their full potential. Great. So you and I, of course, have been friends for a long time, and maybe if you shared with our viewers the story of, of how we met and then how we've worked together over the years. It's interesting because uh, back in the day, you know, we we're both living in Florida. We we're living about 10 minutes apart from each other, and you were always very thick and with a lot of very fine companies over the years. And I remember you were working for a, a very famous company, and you called me because they were doing a big meeting. It was about 10 minutes away, and you said, can you come to this meeting and talk to all these sales reps and motivate them and get them out there? So we had a great time at the meeting, and I think a lot of good things came out of for both of us. And then over the years, I've sort of followed you as you've been on the inside of a lot of these companies while I've been a consultant sort of working on the outside but the paths have crossed and now I'm thrilled to share with Glidewell as a matter of fact uh, now at Glidewell we both have a lot of mutual friends who've been with the business uh, for a while and are really great folks. Well that's great that's great. So as you work with your clients over the years what are some of the challenges that you found in marketing dental implants? Of course, dental implants are oh, just a wonderful modality, but I find that a lot of patients just don't know what they don't know. They don't appreciate the benefits, and it's hard for people to really think ahead and imagine the life-changing benefits of dental implants before they have them. And a lot of patients, I think, get sticker shock. If you ask patients, if you had to go to the dentist and just have a cleaning and exam and x-rays and so forth, how much money do you think you'd spend? They would say, well, I'd probably spend in about three figures. It would be in the hundreds of dollars, which is true. Well, if you had to go to the dentist and you needed something more extensive, like if you needed a crown, how much might that cost? And most people know that now we're looking at four figures. We're looking at something north of $1,000, but within that range. But when people have a large implant case and they sit down and they find out that it could be a five-figure case, I think that really throws them and they get sticker shock. So the, the challenge is to talk to the patient not just about a missing tooth and not just in dental terms about, oh well the opposing tooth, we have to worry about super eruption and we have to worry about missing teeth and malocclusion and shifting teeth and periodontal disease, all very important points, but we have to explain to them that there's an enormous quality of life benefit. And people want to live longer, but they want to live better. And once they find out about the quality of life benefit, then they become intrigued by it. And of course, we've got wonderful testimonials from people who have had dental implants, and we use those testimonials to help reassure people so they will in turn move forward with their treatment. You know, David, you used the term sticker shock. And, and I've, I've heard dentists use that. It's that's sort of a, a car analogy. It is. Right? And, and, you know, and I've heard dentists say to their patients that you know, it, it costs less than a car, but it's gonna, it's gonna last you many years and provide you improvements in your quality of life. Do you think that's a useful analogy for a dentist to use? 
I do like the car analogy, Neil, but I have to tell you something. I think the car analogy needs to be strengthened and needs to be a little bit more specific. So I, I did a little research on this and looked this up. Turns out that the average person in the United States now keeps a car for about 71 or 72 months, which is about six years. That's a wide variety, of course, but that's an average. And the average price of a car in this country now is between $33,000 and $34,000. Again, a big range, but that's the average. So let's just do the math. If somebody buys a car in what we will call year one, and then they buy another one in year six, another one in year 12, another one in year 18, over the course of those 18 years, they've bought four cars. We have to allow for some trade-in value on the cars, but then we also allow, have to allow for some appreciation of price because there is an inflation factor. But no matter how conservatively you do the math, over the course of that 18-year time period, that average person will have spent over $100,000 on automobiles. Now, what do they get? Well, they get convenience and they get transportation. But if they spend five figures on their implant case, they get quality of life benefit. They get aesthetics, they get uh, function, and they also get a tremendous psychological benefit. And what we have to tell the patients is that over this 18-year period, and you can extrapolate that forward <laughs> for 25 or 30, whatever you want, they're spending all this money on automobiles, which is important to their life, but not quite as important as a, as a body part. So when they spend their money on dental implants, this is something that'll last not six years, not 12 years, but usually decades, and very often, as you know, a lifetime. So when we position it that way, and we use the car analogy that way, it, 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 it's obvious that the dental implants are a fantastic value for the dollar, and the benefit of improved quality of life just can't be beat. Wow. So David, here's what our viewers wanna know. <laughs> what is the secret to an effective case presentation for dental implants? That's probably a full day lecture, Neil, but let me, let me just summarize it for you this way. I use what I call a LEAD system, L-E-A-D, and LEAD stands for listen, E stands for empathize, A is assure, and D is direct. And let me just give you a quick example on each one. When I say listen, look, there are fine people working in dental practices. They know about active listening. They're good at this. Doctors and staff are good listeners, but you have to listen carefully to what the patients are saying. For example, one of the questions I like to ask patients who come in, they may have been missing a tooth or multiple teeth for years. And a great question to ask them is, what motivated you to come in today? Why are you here now? And the answer to that question is going to be something we can connect to the case presentation and their motivation ultimately to their acceptance. When we talk about empathy, it's really interesting to me. We have, again, fine people who do empathize with their patients, I know that, but it's not enough to feel the empathy, you have to demonstrate the empathy. And I've heard uh, patients call on the, on the phone and we've listened to conversations where the patient says, uh, I'm embarrassed or I'm upset or I have difficulty chewing or even I'm in some discomfort and someone says, do you wanna come in on Tuesday or do you wanna come in on Wednesday? And the appropriate response is, I'm sorry to hear you're having problems, you came to the right place, we're gonna take good care of you. So that empathy and that connection is very important. The A stands for sure. We're gonna get people who come in and they say, I've never had anything like this before and this is gonna hurt, it's gonna be painful, I don't know what to expect. And we need someone to say, this is what we do to keep you comfortable, or I can assure you the doctor has done thousands of these procedures and the patients praise him not only for being an expert but also for being very gentle. And the D is direct. We want to be low key, we want to be respectful to the patient, but we also want to direct them. They're coming looking for guidance. So we want to say to them, what more information do you need so you can make a decision? What option would you like? Would you like to schedule? Can we get you in? So we have to direct them so that we just don't leave the conversation hanging, but that we're saying, let's, let's get to a decision and if you need more information, we'll provide it. But we're being low key, but we're also sort of gently guiding them in the right direction. So it's, it's, it's listen, it's empathize, it's assure, and it's direct. And we put that into a package for them. There are other things, of course, that go into it, but just to give you a succinct answer to your question, those are some specific things we talk about. So that, found, that sounds like a fairly structured conversation. Do you recommend that doctors and their teams use scripts when talking to patients about dental implants? I get a lot of questions about scripts, but my feeling is that we have to use great verbal skills. And so often the team tells me something contradictory. They'll say, you know, we want the right words. We, we don't want to be stuck and not know the right words, but at the same time, we don't want a, a script that we have to read that says, thank you for coming in today and so forth. And I say, of course you don't want that. You want it to be somewhat spontaneous. So my phrase is, rather than calling it scripts, I call it talking points. 
I want to give you certain talking points that you can use and that you can feel comfortable with, but you can weave them into your own conversation. So for example, if a patient says, you know, I, this seems very expensive, I don't know if I want to do it, I have to think about it, that's a legitimate thing for the patient to bring up and I'm just going to sort of pull this out. You realize this is within the context of a longer conversation, but one of the things we can say to patients if we have certain verbal skills in mind is that the proposed treatment will never be more conservative more cost effective or less invasive than it is today. Let me break that down a little bit. Conservative is a good word to use, not in the political context, of course, but in the context of conservative as opposed to radical. Nobody wants radical dentistry. Then we say it's more conservative, it's more cost effective, which implies value. It also implies, we're not saying this, but the longer you wait, the more it's gonna cost. So cost effective is a good word. And less invasive because people wanna know, can I have the minimum amount of dentistry, not the maximum amount of dentistry. So if we keep those words like conservative and cost effective and less invasive in mind and weave them into our own sentences with our own personality, we've got something very strong to say to the patient, but at the same time, it's not trying to make it up on the fly. Thank you for that, Dr. Park, and we look forward to the rest of your interview with Dr. Schwab. But now, it's time for registered dental assistant Will Schmidt to talk to us about choosing the right impression tray in a segment we like to call Across the Chair. Thank you so much, Megan. Well, today I want to talk about selecting the proper impression tray for your ideal final impression. It is critical to select trays based upon a per patient's need basis and stray away from the habit of simply picking trays that are readily available at that time. A little pre-planning is going to go a long way when it comes to the quality and fit of your patient's final restorations. I would like to go ahead and show some examples of recent patients seen in my operatory and talk about the reasons why we chose their specific trays. So in the case of this patient, we decided on a full arch metal tray for number 30 due to the lack of posterior support since number 31 and 32 were missing. We do not want an opportunity for the bite to collapse. Of course, an opposing full arch impression and a bite registration will follow after the final impression. The main benefit of a metal tray, of course, is its rigidity. It will not bend and warp your impression even through pouring up and models. In this case, however, the patient had some bony exostosis apical of the lower anteriors, which momentarily locked the tray to the arch. In hindsight, a custom tray that relieves undercuts may have been a better option. It is for this very reason I want to reiterate my rule of checking and double checking prior to tray selection. As you can see, once removed, this impression is very serviceable and the patient's restoration was a success. So here we have a similar situation. Both molars are prepped and no posterior stops are here to prevent bite collapse. In this case as well, a full arch is necessary. By planning ahead, checking for undercuts, we verified that none were present and the tray was removed with ease. This patient has a very unique arch anatomy. It is very tight and oblong with an extremely deep palate. We tried a multitude of precise trays, however, none would fit his arch shape without being warped or bent. Of course, I always avoid warping or bending final impression trays. Interestingly enough, I did have to warp a plastic precise tray just to take the impression for his custom tray. Then I had a couple custom full arch trays made in case of any retakes. I prefer a custom trays with holes placed in the acrylic for extra ability to lock impression material to it. As a rule, try your tray in the mouth prior to impression and make sure the walls of the tray do not invade too much into the mucobuckle fold. If needed, adjust your tray with an acrylic burr if you find this to be an issue. After all, your lab tech is merely working off of a model and doesn't have the ability to see folds or tissue. This number 27 anterior crown impression was fairly straightforward. When it comes to an anterior, most times less is more. A triple tray impression made this capture easy to fill, bite, and remove. Notice I selected a metal rimmed tray versus a plastic tray due to the rigidity of this material. This impression was successful on our first attempt. In your search for a great assortment of pre-sized trays, I like to suggest GC America products. As far as selection is concerned, if you're not using a custom tray, you'll find what you're looking for there. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed a different perspective on impression tray selection. I want to leave a lasting impression on you with these two very important points. Make sure to plan ahead and on a per patient needs basis, and mimic the tray you will use for the final impression with the one that you will use for your permanent restoration. Gladwell Laboratories is happy to assist your office with fabrication of custom impression trays, as well as our very own Capture VPS impression materials. Back to you, Megan. That was great, Will. Thank you so much. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Chairside Live. On behalf of everyone here at Gladwell Laboratories, we thank you for watching, and I'll meet you right back here next time.